Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, Elwyn Robinson, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and the author of The Rejuvenate Blueprint. Thank you guys. Thank you all lovely listeners for all of your wonderful comments, your questions, and everything that you're doing to participate with us on this podcast. We are so delighted that you're enjoying it and long may that continue. So please remember if you haven't already hit that bell icon and that subscribe button so you don't miss any episodes. Now today, the episode that we're doing is a little bit different, I think, than our normal how can I say, repertoire, but not really. So um, many of you listening have other members of your family that do often have some of their own health concerns, but I'm not talking about grandma or grandpa. I am talking about your furry little friends. Yes, today we are discussing pet health. Now, I've got two dogs and a cat, and I know Elwin has his menagerie, and we've both come up with certain issues, as I'm sure you guys have as well. And it's, I know I found it extremely frustrating when you can't find that root cause. Just like we are doing on this podcast, really helping and empowering you all to find the root cause, today we're going to dive in and look at that root cause for your pets. So let me ask you this, Elwin, as we begin. Do you think, well, I don't think many people, I think a lot of our listeners really understand that there is that potential crossover, but how often do you think people make that link that what goes on with us can essentially be the same things causing the root issues for their pets? I'm not sure if I've spoken to enough, Chrissy, uh, people about it to be sure about the answer, but I can tell you from my point of view, it only really has dawned on me relatively recently. Um, I always try to stick to my area, as it were, which is basically adult humans. Um, even when people come to me with children with issues, it's like it's still human. But I'm like, mm, you know, I just I don't know about children. There are obviously things that are different about children to adults. Um, and you know, I'd say I know more about probably men than women, only because you know, also don't consider myself in any way an expert on like pregnancy and childbirth and stuff like that. So that's another area. Um, so you know, we're talking about. For instance, cats and dogs, which I think will be the main thing we're talking about. That's that's definitely further away, right? However, as you said, you know, I have a dog. I have too many cats, um, and, uh, and and just over the years, I've uh, you know had some experiences, and I, I guess we have to say usually we have to say at the beginning of the episode. I think it's the what's the word uh, default disclaimer you know not medical advice but with this episode we're going to have to give a new disclaimer which is this is not veterinary advice um <laughs> and of course i i must be honest you know when our animals were animals that had issues my wife's you know impulse was to take them to a vet and my impulse was like yeah you know fair enough that's just what you do but there had been a handful of instances in the last few years and i have three in mind specifically three anecdotes to uh that i kind of prepared for this uh, conversation to illustrate an example of what i'm talking about and also i've been studying it a bit just the last few months and seeing what other people are saying and what other people are doing and actually to answer your original question it has been surprising to me how much overlap there actually is between the the medical approach to humans and the veterinary approach to animals and how in both cases in many cases they are making the same mistakes the same false assumptions uh, ignoring the same basic what i would call basic obvious potential root causes and so um uh, how many people you know, I guess how many people are not seeing the real root causes of pets? I mean, most people, because most people are not seeing the real root causes of any. How many people, though, who are really into and understand the real root causes for humans who, you know, watch podcasts like this, who it might not occur to them that a lot of this is transferable over to at least our mammal friends. You know, it's a bit different once we talk about, you know, fish and reptiles and stuff like that, but at least our mammal friends. Um, Yeah, I, I suspect probably um a significant amount like me hadn't really thought to make that connection um perhaps because they don't have pets in which case maybe why would they but even you know when they do and so yeah i want uh you know i think it's a good idea i i agree that we should talk about it uh because actually most of the rejuvenate blueprint with some modifications can be applied to animals just as easily 
Beautiful. And do you want to just give us a quick uh, rundown really fast if anybody is joining us for the first time of what the Rejuvenate Blueprint is? Yeah. So the Rejuvenate Blueprint posits that there are seven root causes to all chronic disease and all premature aging. So premature aging, I don't claim to have, you know, cracked the key to immortality or anything, but, you know, just feeling older than you are or feeling older than it might be possible to be if you were living optimally. And so that is uh, genetic root causes, uh, deficiencies or insufficiencies, uh, which is usually we're talking about nutrition, but we could also be talking about things like sunlight, oxygen, um, excesses. So usually we're talking about toxins, but this could also be things that are just bad if you have too much, like iron and copper, or um, you know, things that your body treats as if they're a toxin, like allergens. Uh, number four, we're talking about um, imbalances, and with that, there's lots of things, but I specifically focus on hormones and neurotransmitters and peptides as like the big levers that make the most impact. Uh, number five would be pro the broadest category, really, which is lifestyle factors, uh, things like sleep and stress and exercise and all that good stuff that um, a lot of people focus on. You know, rightly so. I just I don't put it first because I find it's often difficult to make lifestyle changes. A lot of people, they don't have the the discipline or the willpower for it, and potentially it's easy to start with other stuff first. Um, number six is chronic infections. Uh, obviously, acute infections also impact health, but they are, you know, either they're resolved or they kill you. So it's more chronic infections that are the root cause of chronic diseases. And then lastly, uh, emotional or psychological uh, issues, things like unresolved uh, traumas, uh, chronic emotional repression, which takes a toll on the body, stuff like that. Great. Thank you for that rundown. I mean, from everything that you've described, and I know we've been talking about it for a while, uh, we have here, it doesn't seem like there's anything that doesn't or can't apply to our animal counterparts, really. I mean, some people may say, okay, seven, but then there's other traumas and things that pets have gone through or separation anxiety and things like that. So it sounds like it can all be applied. Yeah. And, you know, definitely in the case of trauma, there's people who have um rescued animals who've been severely abused will tell you now of course you could say well yes they have emotional issues Owen, but it doesn't necessarily manifest physically but i do not agree with that and in fact i'm going to give you an example of how uh emotional issue can manifest physically as uh one of my anecdotes here wonderful well let's let's uh if you're happy to let's go ahead and start off with that first anecdote about the emotional issue that you experienced firstly i'd like to know you know uh which which pet and the pet's name if you don't mind sharing and you know a little bit of background yeah in fact we'll put um we'll put a picture in there as well for our viewers uh so you can see um so the first example actually yeah relates to what we said so that's our dog um shanty she is uh, just over two years old, I think, or three years old. I should know that. I think it's three years old. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's three years old. Um, I don't feel bad about that. I mean, for all my pets, I just say they're all two, even though I know their age, because like even they're creeping up in age, I still want them to all be two years old. So two's great. <laughs> okay. All right. Two-ish. Um, so yeah, you know, that's the first dog that my wife and I got since I was a child. Last time we had a dog, last time I had a dog in the house, household dog. And um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we got her because it is relevant to then the story. So, uh, you know, when we first went to pick her up, um, she was like in the corner, shaking, like seeing all, seeming all, you know, very anxious about the whole thing. And you could say, well, you know, of course, she's about to be taken away from her mother. But the thing is, like her siblings were around her and they were like totally fine. And so, I don't know, maybe... Um, you know, psychic type person say, oh, she knew or something like that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the, um, anyway, so uh, we take this uh, dog home, beautiful dog, and the whole way back, she's like hyperventilating and panting. And like, it takes her like a couple of days to recover. She doesn't want to eat, all this kind of stuff. And of course, I understand it's traumatic uh, for all dogs, but she seemed to have like a a more traumatized response than average. Although I, you know, I realize with dogs, they have it more than cats in general, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, so a couple of things about this dog. First of all, the breed is Cavachon, which is a cross of Cavalier and Bichon. And uh, we fed her really well. Now, we're going to talk about food afterwards when we get to um, step two. It's not really relevant to this anecdote, but I'll just say as an aside, 
um, that that breed is supposed to get to, um, I think if you, I think if you look at it, like five to ten kilo, uh, sorry, five. What is it? I think it's seven to fifteen pounds. Maybe you can Google it in the background there. Yeah, fifteen to fifteen to twenty five. 50 to 25 pounds. Okay. So it was what I originally thought then, like um, like 7 to 12 kilo. Yeah, okay. Um, and that's for a male, I think, the the top end of it. So this is a female dog. And it is Cavachon. I did a genetic test, and she's like about 25% Cavalier, 7, 75% Bichon. Okay. She she ended up being like a big dog and not fat. Well, I'll show you a picture of her. We can include that, her biggest. But um, she was like... 16 you know 16 kilo something like that it depends which website you look at but basically she was like twice the weight of what you'd expect uh, a female to be um, of that specific breed but otherwise you know healthy and happy and, and all the rest of it and all good and just to clarify as well, I know we'll get into food later, but when you say food, it's not going to be scraps from the table. It's going to be what we would consider a very nice well balanced um, diet for a dog. For you, really. I mean, you. I know you. You're going to be going top quality. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> Scratch the table. Like I've, I did, spoil her giving her pieces of steak from my plate when she was young. Um, I wouldn't consider steak. Like <laughs> I'm talking no. more like you know, like processed stuff, scraps from the table, things. Definitely like that. no junk. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like yeah. yeah, she was given you know high quality raw food. But we'll talk about. We'll get into nutrition. Um, so, but anyway, she was a big dog. I think mainly because. She, she got given like high quality nutrition and I've, because I've also seen this in our cats, which we'll get into, they're all bigger than they should be. And yet not fat. They just seem to be like monsters. <laughs> like it's interesting. Um, you know, what is possible if you give them optimal nutrition anyway, uh, just like with humans, right? The better the nutrition the human gets generally, the taller they grow overall, obviously while there are genetic factors as well. Um, so, so anyway, but we're training this dog, right? And again, it's been a while since either of us have had one, but it's like, she's really not badly behaved, but like she seems to like get overwhelmed and not get it. So uh, we ended up going to this kind of training place that helps to train dogs. And they said, oh yeah, uh, the med this is the funniest medical diagnosis I've ever got. They go, she's a bit of a worry britches. That was the... Um, <laughs> Northern Burby England. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean? Uh, a high genetic tendency. They said it was genetic. Uh, they didn't think she'd be traumatized or anything. Um, just the breed and like the, the way that she came across. A high genetic tendency to anxiety. That's all. I was like, ah, oh, typical, you know. I have a high genetic tendency to anxiety with a background of being traumatized. So does my wife. How typical that we'd end up with a dog who had <laughs> the same thing. Similar qualities, yeah. <laughs> But that's actually not where the commonality ended, which is the interesting bit that I'm about to get to. So then, but anyway, happy dog. Like when we worked out, like basically she was suffering too much from sensory overload. So we just had to like calm her down a lot. And then she was able to like understand what we were saying and follow commands and be a perfectly, you know, happy. And she can do a bunch of tricks. I think you've seen Chrissy, you know, she can do sit and um, uh, you know, offer a paw and lie down and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, perfectly trainable once we worked out that we just had to help her calm down. Anyway, so then a few months ago, um, and, I, you know, this my wife is much better at this. Like, she noticed an issue. The dog, like, eh, seems all right to me, but <laughs> it turns out she was right. Um, so, and I did notice when I'd walk her, she would, like, be always trailing behind and be like come on come on and you know sometimes do, do that like she's just sniffing around and i tend to walk quickly but then after a while usually she'd catch up and then she'd be running ahead of me and stuff but this but now she was like behind me the whole time and it was like you know annoying i'm like this walks for you why am i dragging you <laughs> um and uh so she was also um just seemed to like be too happy to go to bed always. Um, she would just like want to go to her room and lie down. And I was like, and then my well, wife's like, the dog depressed. And um, and then we noticed like she seemed a bit like stiff. And and it's funny, we're at a vet for another issue, another cat, which is, will be the second story here. And there was this poster on the wall and it was like, does your dog have these signs? And it was like, you know, doesn't enjoy exercising as much. And 
you know, this, that, and the other. I can't really remember what the list was anymore. But basically, it hit every single one. I was like, oh, yeah, that's our dog. And it said, she's probably in pain and she doesn't know how to communicate that to you. And I, was, I, don't know, I felt terrible. I was like, oh, no. You know, like, just I didn't realize, right? I thought dogs would whine or something if they're in pain. Again, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. not a dog expert, <laughs> not yeah. claiming to be. Um, but, uh, you know, okay. So that was so, all right. So my wife took Shanti to the vet. And the vet was like, um, that it's this tension in her neck. Because that was the other thing. Her posture, like her head was kind of down. It wasn't up the way you'd, you know, obviously a, a, a dog's would normally be. And so the vet said, oh, it's this chronic tension in the neck. I've seen this many times before. And so, fair enough. What do what does the vet give? Uh, an anti-inflammatory medication and a muscle relaxant. And I was like, well, if it's tension, I don't really see how an anti-inflammatory makes sense. Um, if it's tension, I do say how a muscle relaxant makes sense, but I know in humans that wouldn't be my first poor call. But then again, you know, in humans, you can get them to do different exercises and physio and stuff. I'm not going to you know, understand it's difficult to physio a dog. So I thought, oh, you know, fair enough. Maybe at least to the muscle relaxing, it makes sense. But then this poor dog, you know, first of all, it didn't really seem to help with most of the issues. And then second of all, like my wife is more mainstream than me, although not massively so. Um, but she was like, you know, wanting to do what the vet said. And, but then it came to the point where the dog kind of like fell down when she was trying to go up the stairs. Like, like the muscle relaxants were so powerful, it basically inebriated her, right? She was like a drunk, a drunk dog. And and then she was like, oh, this is not good. And I was like, okay, I'm going to look into this. I'm going to find out what's going on, what to do about it. There must be a way of addressing this. And so, and I wonder if you can guess where I'm going with this story, actually, Chrissy. We haven't discussed this beforehand. What do you think was actually going on? And the clue is, it's something we talk about a lot with humans, and my, I've talked about a lot with myself. <laughs> Well, there's a well. The first thing when you say that that comes to mind is thyroid. Then I'm going to jump to that because I know how often we talk about thyroid. <laughs> okay, interesting guess. So, so I did my usual thing, which is I'm not going to pretend I like pour through you know medical textbooks 16 hours as I usually. Actually, what I normally do is I like focus on it and I put a little bit in my attention and my subconscious, and I'm like, uh, let's you know resolve the answer to this, like find the answer. And then a couple of days later, I'm, you know, innocuously browsing through, I think it's social media or forum or something. And I see this post um, of someone saying hypothyroidism in dogs and what a dog looks like. It was a postural thing before and after with hypothyroidism. And the dog had this exact same posture that our dog has of like the neck being tight and like her head being down. And, and then, you know, other symptoms are, um, you know, weight gain, lack of energy, constipation, which the dog had also suffered with, um, all the same things that, you know, basically apply to humans. And, and I was like, no, surely not. Like, great, because both my wife and I have thyroid issues. Both of us have thyroid medication um, or were. And I'm like... Surely that can't be it. And I was like, well, okay, why am I on thyroid medication? I don't have a genetic tendency for it, but it's because I had chronic stress for so long, along with a bunch of other things, that, you know, eventually it suppressed thyroid function. I'm like, well, the dog has this genetic tendency to chronic stress, you know, excess adrenal activity. Could it, including hyperventilation, right, which then depletes CO2. It's the same for dogs as it is for humans. Um, could she just be hypothyroid? So I look into it more and more. And of course, the other thing, sorry, just to connect to what the vet said. So the vet said it's chronic tension, especially around the neck. Well, chronic tension can be and often is a, uh, a less you know, easily um, identified, less commonly understood, I guess, more side effect of low thyroid function, right? Because fatigue makes sense because thyroid gives energy. Uh, weight gain makes sense because thyroid controls speeding up metabolism. But um, because thyroid is the controller of the level of energy, energy is the thing that um, allows muscles to relax, as we've talked about before when we talk about thyroid. The default state of a muscle is actually tense, which is why when a mammal dies, they become more rigid. They don't become all floppy like jelly. Um, 
and uh, you know, rigor mortis. So I was like, huh, chronic tension, constipation, low energy, weight gain, because I think the correct weight for that dog is about 15 kilo, given um, you know, her frame that she ended up with. But she was like 17 kilos, even something like that. She, I didn't notice she was visibly fat, but I guess she was a little bit. Um, and I was like, could it be? So I was like, and then I looked it up and I was like, hyperthyroidism, it's not commonly diagnosed in dogs like it's not commonly diagnosed in humans, but it did say that it's more common in dogs than almost any other uh, mammal. And I was like, huh, I wonder if that's because they've had this selective breeding, which has, you know, obviously increased traits of obedience and different skills, but probably has also increased this tendency to anxiety and uh, you know, maybe other endocrine dysfunctions that often go with it. So anyway, bottom line, I was like, well, what do they give a medication? What medication do they give to a dog if it has it? Like what dose? I was actually surprised how high the dose was that they routinely give to these animals. And I was like, I was thinking about it and I was like, well, you know, in nature, they would often eat the actual glands of the animal, right? If they caught one. So it's like, let's give us some natural desiccated fire. And I had some left over because I'd switched to um, tea free only. So I had some of this NDT lying around, which is just um, uh, animal glandular, basically. So it's like, let's give her a little bit. And it it was almost miraculous. Um, the This pain went away. She got her energy again. She got her like, joy for life. Uh, the constipation went away. And she lost the weight. Like all of those symptoms just, you know, disappeared over the course of a month or two. And and now, I mean, I, yeah, we, I think we just keep giving it to her. Maybe we'll try and wean her off at some point. Um, but, you know, as I said, it's a natural animal glandular. They get some of it in food anyway, if they were eating a normal diet of, you know, catching and eating animals. And it's a, it's a hunting breed, um, I believe, so... You know, naturally she would be eating, exposed to that, yeah. Yeah, eating smaller, you know, like rabbits and stuff like that, where you would eat, you know, the whole animal, including the uh, the thyroid of the animal. And so I was like, hmm, interesting, you know. And again, manifested exactly the same problem because of exactly the same root cause as you know both of us, both <laughs> both my wife and me. And um, it's just interesting to think, okay, if we'd gone down the vet route you know, of anti-inflammatory and then, and then, uh, you know, the second story I have here, we'll see, you know, I'll illustrate how expensive that can get quickly. Um, yeah, I was going to say, because I know you were able to figure that out and then you obviously had some of that NDT lying around, but once you uh, finish that, like, and maybe you can or maybe you can't speak about it, it's like, well, then what, how did you continue uh, to support Shanti with the with the thyroid medication? Were you getting it yourself or did you have to go back to the vet and say, this is the issue? Can you do something here? This is why this is not veterinary advice. And honestly, I, I'm not 100% sure even if what I'm doing is legal. I, I think you can do what you want to a cat. I, there might be some restrictions with a dog. Um, so please don't report me on this. But, um, you know, I, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it just worked, right? It, it, it worked, there was zero downsides. Um, and we haven't just to answer your question. We haven't run out of um, right, right, right. Of uh, what we still had left over, but um, you know there are companies that sell it um, online. I don't recommend that for humans. I don't think I will be able to find a vet who actually understands this, unfortunately. But if I'm wrong, please put it in the comments. Tell me if there's a vet who actually. Um, you know, is willing to prescribe NDT to a dog because I would much rather do it that way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So so it's been a couple of months now, you're saying, and so she's really looking on the men. No, she's no, longer than that. Walks. Sorry. Oh, okay. uh, how long has it been? At least six months. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, it's, as I said, it took, a, you know, probably two months for her to feel fully better. Right. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I mean, it was early in the year. We're now in October. It's definitely before the summer, six months ish, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And because the other thing is going also back to root cause, it, it sounds like, and nothing against any vets or anything like that, but the 
course of action they would have wanted to have implemented would just have been addressing symptoms, not really looking at the root cause, not helping Shanti get back out of and through the other side of this. Yeah. It would have just been managing. Just like they would for humans, right? It's exactly the same thing, treat the symptoms. Um, so that brings me to my next story. Um, this one is a bit long as well. The third one is not very long. Um, so... Um, we got All right, so which which animal? What's the animal's name? How well, old? <laughs> well, there's a bit of background to that. So we got we wanted to get a Siberian cat last year, and we went to someone, and then basically um, the one that we had chosen actually died. Um, the oh, no. that the I'm person sorry. had severely, honestly, not <clears throat> taken care of them properly. And so we were like, okay, you know, um, and then we I found another one on the spur of the moment. Uh, so a female uh, called Sophie. So we got her this white fluffy cat, uh, beautiful, delightful temperament. I'd say Siberians of all cats um, have the most friendly temperament. You know, um, Sophie is a cutie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, she is, but they're, they're, you know, well, they're all so, yeah, I'm going to tell they the story. Are, yeah. So now, then, just after we got Sophie, the other owner ca uh, came back and said, actually, like, um, we, you know, the brother is alive and the person who's going to have them dropped out, do you want them? And then I was like, oh, and then, but you know, they sent photos, and my wife saw them. I was like, "Oh!" And, and let's like, also keep in mind, before Sophie, how many cats you also had as well. <clears throat> one. So hence, two, the, hence three. the potential potential hesitation there. <laughs> yeah, we already <laughs> had three cats. One. Yeah, yeah. Um, two hairless cats and a Bengal cat. And I have a story about the Bengal cat last. Um, but the Bengal cat is an outdoor cat. Like that's yeah, she's basically she was one who catches mice and. <laughs> our garden is currently it's like a killing field with the amount of uh, <laughs> mice out there at the moment so she's certainly effective at doing that uh, job because we live in the countryside right so uh, she's great but yeah she's not an indoor cat so we wanted a like a, a fluffy indoor cat and so we got that one at yeah delightful temperament so as I said then this this person who we were originally going to get one from was saying oh uh, you know this cat's available and this was a cross between Siberian and a Russian blue. They're both hypoallergenic breeds. Sorry, I should just explain that as well. Um, although I seem to be fine with cats these days. I, when we had our first cat, I was bothered by her fur. So we tried to avoid the ones that there's a chance of that happening. So we end up getting that one as well. And um, that one was so sick. That one had like so many different infections. Um and then, of course, we didn't realize that because they claimed that they had done the vet screening and they were all healthy and all the rest. So we allowed the one kitten to see the other kitten. So both those kittens got infected. And it was a whole nightmare. My story isn't really about that because we did follow the conventional vet route in that case of applying antifungal and antibacterial medication. And it was ultimately successful. Um, although I did give them activated charcoal and CBD oil at the time, especially Sophie was like very small and didn't want to eat. And so I was, you know, we were worried she was going to waste away. Um, and so CBD oil stimulated her appetite. So that was good. Um, and the charcoal was accidental. I would be drinking, drinking my charcoal drinks and they would go up and they'd start licking the lid of my, ch cause I would usually put it in a jar and I was like, maybe they want charcoal. So we started giving them charcoal and they just loved it. Um, so again, smart. Obviously, it doesn't resolve the problem in the case of infection, but it doesn't mop up the toxins. The infection's great. Uh, but that's not the story of the society issue. Anyway, so we end up with these two cats, a male and a female, um, Adam and Sophie. And, you know, we love them so much. And, uh, you know, they're just delightful. And uh, basically, through a series of <laughs> uh, whatever, uh, they ended up breeding. Um, and <laughs> so we're like, all right, oh, well, Owen. it's a it's a breed that um, other people want, right? So you know, we won't be stuck with them all. Uh, you know, obviously, we wouldn't 
give them away to a whatever but you know we wouldn't have to like it's a desirable breed so okay and um so sophie ended up giving birth to four uh, healthy babies um healthy kittens and that was an experience i've never had newborn kittens in the house and it was great and i especially bonded with one of them uh, even at three weeks old, she would come over to me and and lie on me and <laughs> uh, like be purring and stuff. Maybe not purring at three, maybe it's four. But anyway, you know. So I've never had that experience before. Um, but that, so and we were going to sell like three of them, and we ended up keeping three. <laughs> we only sold one. So you only got rid of one. <laughs> okay. So your tally now is that was three, four, five, eight. Eight, yeah, correct. <laughs> so we ended up with eight um, because of my, um, what's the word, foolishness and <laughs> soft heart, whatever you want to call it. I was going to say that, yeah, you've got a soft center right there. <laughs> um, and also we love cats. Like both, yeah. both, they're not like default, you know, anything. Like we, we both always love cats as kids, uh, my wife and I, and we still do. Um, so, you know, it's what we ended up doing. Genetic Insights provides cutting-edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy, and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours, you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. All right, so Sophie and Adam have had four kittens. You've kept three back and one has gone off to a, a loving home. Yes. And so the oldest one, the first one born out of the four, who we called Elon, um, Elon was a bit of a troublemaker. He... Um, <laughs> reflected his name. Um, <laughs> he was a little bit antagonistic to uh, his brothers and sisters sometimes. But anyway, so he was like three months old, four months old, something like that. Um, and he, what would happen is he would like, he would be a bit at, like, what's the word? Irritable. But sometimes he would like scream out in pain and... Um, and like he would then wouldn't like he would just like hide and run away and like someone had just done something to him, someone had just hurt him or whatever. And so again, my wife is more on top of this than me, but she noticed before I did, and she's like, oh, and I said, like, okay, well, let's see. And yeah, sure enough, it happened again. So she took him to a vet, and they were like, yeah, there's definitely something going on. It was like with his right back paw, I think, um, and he was definitely in pain if you moved it and and stuff. So okay. So she takes him to a vet and they, um, like they, they, they do some tests that cost a few hundred pounds, dollars. And that didn't show up anything. And then they like, oh, you have to have different equipment. So then she goes to another vet 
and I think they did they did an X ray, and the cat's got to be like anesthet uh, anesthetized mm-hmm. anesthetized yeah, yeah. for that. So it's a whole thing. It took all day, and again, it was you know several hundred pounds and all the rest of it. And they, I can't remember the whole story to be honest anymore. It took a while, but I think by the time I intervened, it had been like four different vets. It was a bunch of money, and no one could really work out why this cat was in pain. Um, the x-ray wasn't showing up anything. And then my wife is like, they're saying that he needs a CT scan and I've got to drive whatever it was two hours away and it's going to be 1,500 pounds and Another that, round of anesthesia as well for this poor cat. So there's more toxins going in, the stress of it all probably as well. Yeah, and she's like, is that okay? And I was like, if it's the only option, then yeah. But I, I'm, you know, again, I had this thing, right? Because I don't claim to be an expert in animals at all. But I was like, something must be being missed here. And I said, he's in pain. I think the thing that got me is their insistence that it must be something in the skeleture, the skeletal system, rather than that it could be soft tissue. Because my understanding um, of human beings is that, sure, obviously, if someone has extreme pain around a limb or something, you do an x-ray. That's perfectly reasonable. And if you find a break or a crack or a hairline fracture or something, then fine, you you treat it accordingly. Um, but a lot of the time, human beings don't, you know, most people who have chronic pain don't have that. That's not the root cause. That's only ever the root cause of acute pain anyway, because it heals after a while, even if it sometimes heals wrong. Um, so it, it's the, the, and you know, we talked about this before in the pain and inflammation episode that, there's this obsession with seeing um, like this uh, like bone or you know vertebrae. Yeah, correlation to the pain. Oh, this disc is da-da-da-da, so therefore that's what's the cause of this pain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is medical, but it's, you know, chiropractic, osteopathic. You know, they'll do an x-ray and they'll go, okay, this is out of alignment. This is what's causing the pain. But there is one question you can always ask them, which they don't have a good answer for, which is, is there anyone whose bones look the same or who has the same bulging disc or the same misaligned vertebrae or whatever who does not have pain? And now, again, it doesn't count with a fracture, crack, or break, right? If you ask that question, is there anyone who has this bone broken who's not in pain, they'll say no. <laughs> so that's fair enough, right? That's a different thing. But in terms of you know a lot of these, it's out of alignment and it's bulging and it's this and that, the actual answer is and herniated, all that kind of stuff. The actual answer is, uh, yeah, there actually are quite a few people who have exactly that and they have no pain whatsoever. And so in that case, it's not necessarily a root cause from my point of view. And we discussed that already in the pain episode. But in this case, um, I was thinking, well, my understanding is that the way it's usually looked at from the mainstream point of view is like the skeletal system sets the... Uh, structure and like the soft tissue around it is neither here nor there but my understanding of what's actually true is that usually it's the soft tissue that especially you know the uh, fascia but it could also be joints tendons ligaments muscles that then pull things out of alignment that then potentially cause you know pressure where things are being pressed against each other or you know, vertebrae are too uh, uh, compacted or, you know, something's bulging or something's at the wrong angle or something like that. That's usually caused by chronic tension in the muscles, not by the uh, skeletal system itself being out of alignment. And I suppose chiropractic is kind of based on that same principle. That's why they keep doing the um, adjustments with the idea that the muscular system eventually or fascia, et cetera, all kind of adjusts and gets used to the skeletal system being in a different positioning, which is more aligned and healthy. So with Elon, I was just thinking, you know, they can't find an issue even with an X-ray. Maybe it's because the issue is not skeletal, right? 
So then I ring around to a bunch of different vets and I explain the situation to them. And I basically just kind of wait until I talk to someone who actually seems to have some common sense. And it wasn't that long until I found someone. It wasn't the first person I called. Um, and it was this person who it turned out um, had been working, for the, you know, they were asking the phone, but they'd been working for this vet practice a long time, but they, they actually understood. And they booked us in with the most senior vet who had been doing it, you know, 40 years, something like that, and had a lot of experience. And they were kind of, I guess, the person who you would go to, you know, if everyone else in the practice wasn't able to work it out, but they kind of fast tracked us straight to that to her because we'd already seen whatever it was, four or five other vets at that point. So we go there, and she's like, "Oh no, you don't need that CT scan, as you said, Chrissy. Or just traumatize him for because that was the other thing. After the X-ray, they had to put him in this really uncomfortable position to do the X-ray. So then he was in agonizing pain for like five days afterwards. Sorry, I should have said that was the main point because then it was like you know it was extremely." painful for him it was difficult for us because when a young kitten doesn't like to rest so he would constantly try and do stuff and he'd be screaming out pain again it's like a whole thing so like it's gonna ha it's gonna happen all over again um if we do another one of these in these fetized scans and so we went to this vet and she said oh yeah it's um it's uh it's just soft tissues pulling the uh pulling things out of alignment or it's an infection um, that's possible as well because that's hard mm -hmm. to see, which again is a soft issue issue. Um, and so she gave us antibiotics and anti-inflammatory and basically, you know, got us to encourage him to rest. And in that case, I was happy to use those mainstream, you know, both of those things made sense. Again, I'm not totally against antibiotics. I think they, they have their place. Um, and And basically he got better. And I was like, I'm so glad we didn't go down the system of like insisting that it must be an issue with the skeletal system. And and I say this because, you know, first of all, for pets and then even for humans, right? That there are people with these pains who then go in and they have like back surgery and shoulder surgery and vertebrae surgery and all this kind of stuff. And all because there's something out of alignment, but it could be that it's being pulled out of alignment because of and usually is in my opinion it's being pulled out of alignment because and so the whole fascia system um so fascia just to remind people is this extremely thin kind of translucent uh stuff which is wrapped around muscles that keeps it on the bone as it were um if you've ever had to prepare meat it's that very thin translucent stuff you have to kind of cut off um and and fascia it turns out is super super important it actually is very much connected to the uh, nervous system the somatic sensory system and it responds very much to emotions and it responds very much to to trauma and so uh i think in elon's case what was happening to him as i said he was always a bit like irritable compared to his brothers and sisters really from you know the first moment he can move I think before he had any injury I think he injured himself I was gonna ask yeah where was the inception of this yeah I think he injured himself but I think what happened is because he was a bit of a bullshit person unlike his his brother who's very easygoing or his sister who is um maybe not easygoing but you know not like him and um, and so he would get into fights with his brother and sister. Like they would do something, he would tense up, and it would just aggravate and exacerbate this injury over and over and over again. I think that's what was uh, actually going on. Um, and so, you know, again, it, it could have gone down a bad place because you know after the CT scan, the next step that they would do is exploratory surgery. Surgery. Right? I was going to say because it's wonderful because you have such a background in investigative health and looking and diving so deep into these things and an understanding of the workings of the physical form that you know you questioning this of like mm, is this the way is it this thing I mean I I, I 
oh goodness, you know, all of those people that are trusting or thinking, okay, this is the way they tell me I have to do this. And then it going so far down the line and nothing being resolved. That's the thing that pains me. Yeah, and that's why I bring it up. I realize none of these stories are like impressive or, you know, very dramatic or anything. It's not like I brought an animal back to life or anything like that. But it is just, I want to illustrate this point that um, the same basic principles do, you know, potentially in a lot of cases apply. Certainly, well, the seven root causes do apply to, you know, any mammal at least, just as much as the human. Uh, even though there's some modifications, obviously animals have different nutrients that they need to some degree and there's different things that are toxic to them to some degree and all the rest of it. Um, and there's different things even that they are infected by to some degree. But it's still the basic, the same basic root causes. And, you know, in terms of that emotional connection to, you know, trauma and pain and muscle tension and all the rest of it. Um, and so, yeah, basically what we did with him we isolated him away from his brothers and sisters. That's what we hadn't done before. Sorry, I left that bit out other than the medication. So he literally didn't have anyone to fight with. And then as soon, because that was really it, he would, he would fight. Rest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he would fight with someone and right. then he would... Re-injure. Like, yeah, yeah re-injure, but stroke also tense himself up, which then, you know, exacerbated the injury, you know, like put pressure on it. Um, and so, yeah, basically by not having anyone around to fight with, as soon as he started being, trying to fight with us, we'd just leave. Um, and, you know, between that, um, and, you know, people are like, oh, Elwin, well, that's nothing to do with it. It was the medication. Well, he, he'd already had anti-inflammatory medication. Um, could it have been the antibiotics? Maybe, but the vet herself said that was unlikely. She was just doing it as a desk, just in case there was no, right. There was as no, a backup. There was no puncture wounds. There was no, you know, indi there was no swelling. There was nothing that actually indicated an infection. It was, as you said, Chrissy, just like a backup option. So I think the likely thing is uh, just, yeah, he injured himself and he kept re-injuring himself by tensing up when he was getting aggressive, uh, basically. Um, and then, yeah, just the last quick story, the, the, the first hairy cat we've had for a long time, the Bengal cat, um, called Izzy, we put a picture of her in there, she's beautiful, kind of leopard stroke tiger markings. And of course, Bengal cats are partly descended from wild cats. And so, you know, one of my advices for pets is if you possibly can, let them go outside. You know, everything that we talk about with grounding and sunlight and fresh air being super important for humans, um, it, it's all of that stuff is 100% true for animals. But especially, and the more wild they are, the more true this is, obviously our sphinx cats, which are hairless, the mutated cats, <clears throat> they we have to be more careful with letting them outside because they could get too cold. But uh, with Izzy, like she needs to be outside. And I see, I've seen like documentaries and stuff about people with Bengal cats where they keep them indoors 100% of the time and then these Bengal cats develop behavior problems. It's like, of course they do. You know, like that's not... I'm sorry if you're if you're doing this if you feel judged, but that you know a partly wild cat is not something to have in a in a one bedroom apartment and you know not allow outside. And yeah, I know that you can let them on a leash and stuff like that, but um, yeah, I, I really feel like um, there are some breeds of cats that are okay-ish being indoors. As I say, like a sphinx is one of them. S Siberian, you know, because they're so friendly and tame, they would be okay with it, although it isn't super healthy for them. But uh, like this Bengal cat needed to be outside. Now, having said, because if, if not, she is literally starting fights with everyone, like attacking stuff, destroying stuff, uh, very unhappy herself, you know. And um, but anyway, so we let her outside. But of course, outside stuff happens, right? Of course. And just to go back, because the the lifestyle, I think that also goes into uh, which step is that? Is that five? Or is that six? Yeah, five, step five. So that's also something to look at too. If you think about, oh, is the lifestyle and the environment the correct one for not only for myself, because obviously we talk about that a lot on this podcast, <laughs> but also for your pet, like you were just saying for Izzy. I mean, that's a major factor. Yeah, we'll talk about that. And uh, we'll, uh, hopefully I'll we'll have time to just go through the rejuvenate blueprint quickly for, for animals um, in the second half of this. But yeah, so basically Izzy injured herself, kind of similar thing. She had a little bit of a limp and she just had, and I tell this story partly to give like a contrast because 
similar situation, but you know, we ended up dealing with it completely differently. So in the case of Izzy, she had it and then she would kind of get better and then she would get worse again. And, you know, we could have thought it was the same thing where she kept re-injuring herself and that is possible. But I was still thinking like, you know, why? Like this is, she was an adult Bengal cat. These are super tough animals. You know, if you, if you learn about cats, they are, I uh, saw sort a of documentary that describes them as the ultimate predator. Um, and I think that is kind of true. Like they have an amazing, you know, ability to land on their feet and to basically not get injured, you know? So it's like, why does she keep getting injured? And so um, that's around that time that Izzy had been suffering with that already for a few months is where I found out about the um, the vitamin A issue and that it may may not be a vitamin, it may be a toxin. I know at least half of our viewers are upset with me for saying that. But what I want to say, which I think is more moderate, is let's assume that it is an essential nutrient Still, my concern with it is that it is something that accumulates that we may well be getting too much of and that too much has been shown definitely by hundreds of studies to be bad for us. So let's stick to that for a second. Uh, you don't have to believe anything other than too much is bad and it does have a tendency to accumulate because it is fat-soluble. So if those thing two things are true, um, I was looking at, Okay, so the recommended amount for humans is about 3,000 IU. And, you know, some people are getting more than that. Maybe some people are getting less. Uh, it's not easy to get less, though, because if you're a vegetarian, vegan, you tend to eat a lot of greens and carrots and stuff, which is high in the plant form. Um, you know, probably actually being like a muscle meat carnivore would be the most likely to have low vitamin A, uh, unless you're eating liver. It's, it's high in liver, it's high in organ meats, it's high in dairy, it's somewhat high in fish, um, somewhat high in eggs. So yeah, it's really only muscle meat that doesn't have it for, from an animal point of view. So anyway, it's pretty hard to be depleted in it from my point of view. But what was crazy is that, so the human, average human weight, you know, 70 kilos, something like that, 3,000 IU recommended. The amount that they are putting in cat food as a standard was about 5,000 IU per day. So the average cat is about uh, four kilos, I think. Uh, average human, 70 kilos, and yet they're giving 50% more vitamin A to a cat than they are a human. And I was going, is this based on something? Like, I know, you know, from a um, the Korean types point of view, which we did an episode about a while ago, they say, you know, the thing that is outstanding about a cat is they do have a strong liver, uh, which is required for like a, a pure carnivore. So dog, the most outstanding thing about a dog is they have a strong stomach with a lot of stomach acid. That's why they can eat literal excrement and be totally fine because the stomach acid will just kill everything. Um, whereas if you feed a dog a very fatty meal, often it will give them digestive disturbance. So what that tells me is stomach acid... Great, very high, because they can eat the most toxic, poisonous, not toxic, sorry, but uh, <laughs> full of infection stuff and not get sick. But if they have a fatty meal, it disturbs them because they don't have the bile to deal with them. Um, cat, a little bit the opposite, right? Cat can't just freely eat any infectious thing without having a problem, but they can eat very fatty meat and they're totally fine with it. So they have a strong liver and a strong bile. So, so I'd expect that, being that that being the case that they can handle vitamin A pretty well because they can produce a good amount of bile to excrete any excess. But still, for something like 5% of the size of a human to be getting 50% more, like this doesn't seem... I, and I tried to find a basis for it and I could find no basis, no justification at all as to why these animals would be given such a high level of vitamin A. If you, why do you think they're doing it? I mean, like, if there's no justification, why do you think they're doing it anyway without the justification? Do they just think more is better? I mean, I don't understand. I may be ignorant on this. If someone wants, if a pro vitamin A person wants to educate me and say, actually, I wouldn't, da, 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 feel free, put that in the comments. Um, I have not found anything. A lot of these things, Chrissy. 
it's very, you know, we touched upon this a little bit in the episode that we did recently about selecting a practitioner. It's very, the, the kind of default for a, a mammal, really any mammal other than a cat, is to be kind of like a pack animal, a herd animal, and to just kind of go along with what everyone else is saying. And so there's a lot in science where... You know, bef you know, before we had science, we had religion. And then, you know, there were a lot of things in there that didn't really seem to make sense. Um, but then you weren't allowed to question it. And if you did, it's, you know, because we told you so, because we said so. And that's just the way it is. It's like, you know, dogma backed up by authority and tradition. This is the way we've always done it. Um, this is the way everyone does it. It's just because I said so, because God said so, whatever. And so with science... You know, true science isn't about that. True science is about discovering truth, doing empirical experiments. Um, you know, real world, real world results are all that matters, evidence, etc. But a lot of science has kind of been religionized, and so there is a bit like I suspect there was probably some study at some point that indicated something, and it probably wasn't even on cats. You know, it's usually on mice or rats or even on tissue culture or something, and it kind of indicated something. And then someone said, yeah, because of that, this, and then no one questioned it. And it just becomes the orthodoxy. Like, and, and then once something is the orthodoxy, so something goes, the, the progression between no, no one has any idea and this is just the way it is, shut up, don't question it, is way too quick in science. And there was way too much assuming going on. Now, pro-science, anti-religion people say, well, it's still better than it was, right? It used to be a bunch of, you know, random dogmatic stuff that was just because I said so. At least we have studies. At least we have evidence. At least we have, you know, hypotheses that we test and all the rest of it. Okay, sure. But, you know, especially when it comes to living processes, there's still so, there's so much assumption and dogma and... And you see it, you know, I, I won't give it, uh, I won't go into examples now because it's site tangent and a lot of them are, you know, controversial. But I'd say if, if the, you know, if, if the world situation between 2020 and 2022 did not teach you that maybe the authorities don't have all the answers, then you're probably never going to get it. But I think a lot of us <laughs> who up until then were just believing what we were told about everything. And I'm not even saying about any particular opinion. I'm talking about how they would just change, right? I mean, I'll give an example, right? Uh, masks are bad. They're a waste of time. Um, they don't really work. Direct quote uh, from, you know, the head of uh, that response. And then a few <laughs> months later, masks are essential. They must be worn. They are uh, crucial. If you don't, you're killing your, your grandmothers. And then a couple of years later, actually, it's fine. You don't have to wear them after all, you know, most of the world. Like, so I'm not even talking about any particular position. I'm just talking about the inconsistency and then the uh, extreme authoritarian, like, of course you don't need to wear a mask. Don't be silly. Versus, of course you do need to wear a mask. How dare you question us to, well, actually you don't, like, you know, it, it so again, it's it's not about whether your opinion is, but it, it's the switching between things. And there's a lot of exa other examples I could give, which are a lot more you know controversial still. So I won't just because I don't want to get banned on YouTube. Um, but you know, the, the, if we haven't learned by now that the authorities, I, I, I will give one example because I've already said this before. I knew in early 2020 when there are all these people dying that the main reason that they were dying is because they're being built on oxygen ventilators that's such a bad idea it's just depleting co2 more and more which is an essential nutrient that's the last thing they need depleted when they're already struggling and it's frying their lungs of oxygen like i knew that and yet all the world's foremost health medical and scientific authorities somehow didn't know that seriously i actually don't believe that they didn't know that i think a bunch of them probably did but the one, you know, most of them were afraid to say anything and the ones who did say something were, you know, bribed or threatened and the ones who didn't shut up sometimes, you know, more you know, they were fired or all their funding was taken away or their license was revoked or whatever. Like, th there is this authoritarianism, I think. So, now, do I think that all that stuff has happened in the world of pet nutrition? No. 
I, but I think the fact that that is the culture means that once something is set in place as this is the thing, so in this case, this is the recommended daily uh, uh, intake of this nutrient, you know, like questioning that is, you know, do you want to be ridiculed? Do you want to have your funding removed? Do you want to, like, it's just not worth it to, yeah. to, to most scientists, unfortunately. Yeah, I, it's definitely once something is in place, it's so hard to then backtrack it or bring it back or go like, oops, sorry, <laughs> it's not not where we were supposed to go. Yeah, that's a difficult space. But, you know, going back to, yeah, we you know what you were saying too as well, and, just for... And sorry, this ahead. is in all fields of science. You know, I was just yeah. into... Um, uh, Eric Weinstein talking about um, quantum physics recently and about how they'd gone down this particular path that he considered a dead end of string theory for decades and how, you know, anyone who dared question that that was the correct uh, road to go down was, you know, attacked and ridiculed and this and that. And like, even with something that seems as innocuous as that, which is really just a bunch of, you know, theoretical speculation, it's a bunch of math on a on a board, you know, like it's not, there's no, you know, no big business interest and all the rest of it. Like, like that just seems to be the culture in science in general. I guess is the point that I'm making. That you know, people very aggressively defend their position. I guess that's always the case. This is what I'm saying. Like, you know, religions throughout the ages, right? Like, people are not. Oh, maybe you're right about this. You know, it's like I'm going to fight and die for my particular thing, my particular dogma, uh, no matter what. And so, unfortunately, that's the way it is in science. So that's my suspicion as to why it's so high to answer your quest original question. Someone decided, probably someone did a test of giving that much, the organism didn't die, they extrapolated out of that that it's safe, and then the that's now the amount they put in all the food. That would be my guess. So to go, to go back to what I did with Izzy, um, I, I just put her on a zero vitamin A diet because uh, I realized she'd been having such a high amount. And I put, well, in fact, I put all the animals on it. And because um, before they've been having liver and as I said, all the kind of pre-prepared food, it all pretty much seems to have either liver in it or it has vitamin A in it. Occasionally both, but usually it's one or the other. It's actually very rare to find one that doesn't have either. Okay, so a zero vitamin A diet for Izzy, but then you also put the all the animals on that. So because then most of the... Well, then I'm assuming you were feeding them fresh f foods that you made yourself. Yeah, I'll get to that in a sec. But just to finish the thing with Izzy, so then she, um, like this problem which kept happening, like this limp, which we couldn't understand, which had been the case for months. So people were like, oh, well, it would have healed itself anyway. Well, it was never bad enough that, you know, it was like a break or whatever. It was just a limp. It, it wasn't painful when you touched it and moved it around and stuff like that. But anyway... So that's why we didn't, you know, take her for x-rays and stuff. But anyway, it just, it just, you know, literally within like a month of stopping the vitamin A, it just went away. And then, you know, I happened to see, um, actually, again, that was just a random thing of seeing someone comment, on, I think a forum saying that they'd had this experience with their animal where it had been limping for a very long time. And then they put it on a, again, I'm pretty sure it was a cat and they put it on a, uh, low vitamin A diet and then the cat just healed itself I was like well you know I'll try it then and you know that was exactly my experience now placebo effect I don't think you know Izzy's very what's the word immune to basically doesn't do what she's told at all I don't think my belief that that would heal her like magically healed her somehow I think that's a bit of a stretch so uh it could be a coincidence these are just three examples as I say none of them are super impressive stories but the three examples of where applying all the stuff you've heard so far on this podcast, <laughs> I guess that's the point, to an animal might actually make sense. Absolutely. It, it, it does, I was, you, no, I don't know. It does trickle down. It's like, oh, okay, well, if this applies over here. Because then you also look at it like, um, if you want to call it, you know, as it is, it's the rejuvenate blueprint, you know, the guidelines, the, the areas, the factors to look at just, why wouldn't it apply? Why wouldn't it work over there when it's working here? It's not like we're in completely different systems and have completely different, um, you know, food intake, things like that. Um, you know, yes, with the eight, with the eight body type, obviously looking at cats versus dogs versus, you know, carnivore, 
omnivore, things like that too. There's those differences which can come in, but yeah, it, it makes absolute sense of, you know, what you were talking about here can definitely be applied, mostly be applied to our, our lovely pets that live with us that can get the same issues as we do. Okay. All right. So yes, you were mentioning about going into diet. So do you want to explain to us you know, what your process was, was figuring out the foods, the preparation, because I know you're a busy person. So is your wife, it's like going, cause where I go to is like, oh my goodness. Okay. Having to prepare that much food for that many pets, you know, from scratch, were you able to do that? Or were you able to source the food elsewhere? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, well, actually, Let's just do the rejuvenate blueprint. So oh, uh, okay, yeah. let's start with number one. There could be genetic causes, you know, and I gave one example of that. In the case of my dog, she's got anxiety. You know, there are some dogs that because they breed, uh, breed they're going to have breathing problems. Uh, different dogs do have different um, potential issues, and it is good to know that uh, about the breed. If you have a specific breed or if you have a mongrel uh, or whatever they call it, a big breed, then that you can actually do a genetic test find out what breeds they're made up of and you can kind of go you know go back and look and say okay well they're whatever 20 percent this breed what issues is that breed likely to have there are also genetic tests you can do where it will tell you if they have markers for certain diseases it is nowhere near as comp comprehensive as genetic insights uh but it is available so just mention that um God, i don't know if i'd recommend the company i used because um yeah, for various reasons. So I don't want to recommend anyone, but you know, do your own research, and and I, I can tell you there is companies out there who offer that service. Okay, so but do, just to go back to genetic insights quickly, would it be the same process? You order the DNA kit, you do the little swab on the pet, and then send it in. Yeah. Yes. So, super simple. Okay. Uh, less simple with a cat, definitely, to get saliva than a human. No, but... just have them purring, and it, it just starts to come, drip down. <laughs> it depends on the cat's temperament. Again, with our Siberians, yeah. it's fine. With Izzy, uh, she would not be impressed. Um, but, you know, there we go. So with the uh, with the Bengal tiger uh, cat. So, yeah, so that's genetics in a nutshell. So, yeah, let's go to nutrition because nutrition is super important. So... I remember seeing um, this study where uh, these perfectly healthy cats were uh, fed like nothing but cooked food and then they were bred and then there's another generation and they fed them nothing but cooked food again and they did this several times. I think it was by the third or I tried to find this before this, Chrissy, but I couldn't. Uh, so I'm having to do this in memory, unfortunately. Again, if you if you know the specific study, please post it underneath for us and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Um and anyway, after like three or four generations of being fed only cooked foods, the cats developed all these, you know, severe and significant health problems. This shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Um, there's an argument to be made that human beings have adapted to cooked food. You know, this depends a little bit about your beliefs about history and stuff. But from a mainstream point of view, you know, we probably have been cooking food for at least hundreds of thousands of years, probably millions. And so we should be reasonably adapted to cook food to some degree by now. Uh, now, you know, in the case of dogs, I think the earliest case of domestication that they're aware of is tens of thousands of years ago. So even there, it could be uh, maybe a little bit adapted to cook food. I think in the case of cats, though, obviously, you know, there's, there's domestication of cats in ancient Egypt. Um, you know, famously, they had cats in sarcoph sarcophaguses and stuff like that. Um, sarcophagi they treated them you know very uh with a lot of respect and i think this is partly because it it was one of the you know the one of the first ancient civilizations and the reason it was able to be a civilization is because they kind of adapted from hunter gatherers to being a grain-based uh agrarian um nutritional intake society and obviously having cats around to protect that grain from rice, mice and, from mice everything. and rats, and yeah. all the rest of it. So there was probably a practical reason for that. But even then, I don't know how much they were feeding cats cooked food, as opposed to maybe a little bit. But the, the main point was that the cats would catch the things that were trying to steal their food. Um, so they were having at least a decent proportion of raw food still. So basically, what I'm saying is, I think especially in the case of cats, they're really not adapted to cook food. There was a big movement. Uh, I see. I'd say big. I mean, it's not the majority, but it's it's significant minority 
of companies and even vets who are promoting raw food for cats and dogs. And I'm a big fan of this. Um, I think cooking, giving cooked food to animals uh, is crazy. Now, as a treat, sure, like I said, it's a piece of steak off my plate to the dog or whatever, uh, that's fine. The, the thing they can throw you about this as well is they do prefer cooked food, generally, mm. animals. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, it smells better, it tastes better to them or whatever. That's fine. But, you know, children also prefer sweets to, you know, <laughs> most natural food doesn't mean it's good for them, right? So I, I would consider cooked food a treat and not a staple of the diet of a cat or a dog. And, and I think that's the way it should be. So the cooked meat is the treat. And then the raw meat is the staple food, as opposed to cooked meat being the staple food and some horrific, poisonous crap being the treat, which tends to be what a lot of people do with uh, cats and dogs that I observe. So I think not cooking the food is key. And in terms of what actually to feed them then, so no, I don't give them liver, and it'll upset some people. Um, so... The only nutrient that I understand that is missing from uh, like just normal meats that you would get in, say, minced beef or minced chicken or whatever, um, is significant amounts of taurine. So taurine is an amino acid that's considered non-essential for humans, but it is considered essential for cats, especially. Um, there's an argument to be made about calcium as well. So some of the raw food sellers will put a lot of ground bone in there. And I say a lot, like sometimes it's 40% or something. Our experience is so calcium causes constipation. That's true in animals and humans. Uh, I'm not against using a little bit of bone meal, but I think the amount often that they put in these raw things, it just constipates them. Also, it's it's like sharp pieces that can irritate the intestinal lining. So I, I would say keep that to not nothing, but a minimum. Um, I wouldn't give a diet that's like 40% bone meal like a lot of these raw food people are selling. I think they're just doing it because it's cheap, right? So it's a bit of a con. Um, so I think a combination of muscle and connective tissue. Um, so as I say, like minced beef is you know a simple example of that because it has pretty much everything in it other than the most expensive cuts. Uh, ditto with you know minced chicken. So that's an easy way to provide it. Now in terms of what you just said, Chrissy, about the preparation and all the rest of it, my wife goes to a bit more like effort for them than I do. But literally, when I feed them, I go in the fridge, I take out a packet of minced beef or minced chicken usually. Sometimes we get hearts for the taurine. So, uh, you know, minced chicken heart, uh, no, sorry, just pieces of chicken heart uh, or beef heart, sometimes lamb. And then I take it out of the fridge, I get a spoon, I put it in the container, I take it out, I put it on a plate, that's it. Preparation over. So, <laughs> well, where are you purchasing your your minced beef, minced chicken, and the heart from? Exactly the same place I get my own, basically. So, uh, in the case of chicken, I get it from this place that does like herb fed, genuinely pasture raised chicken that is you know affordable. And <laughs> in the case of Izzy, she actually refuses to pretty much eat anything other than it. She won't eat normal. She won't eat normal organic chicken. She only likes the herb-fed chicken, so she's, like, spoiled. Um, and, you know, I don't indulge them too much. I'm like, if, you know, if it's out of stock, I'm like, you know, tough luck is you. You're just going to have to eat something else. And she does eventually, but she's really not happy about it. Um, so Izzy especially likes the chicken. Yeah, beef, you know, same thing. And I do vary it between the two for all the animals, you know, because they do have different nutritional profiles. Um, and, yeah, you know... Is it, is it the cheapest thing in the world? It's, you know, about £10 a kilo for both of them. So because I'm buying that high quality. Uh, now, I realise to some people that may seem like an unaffordable uh, luxury. And, sorry, not seem like it may be an unaffordable luxury, uh, which is fair enough. As I said, you can definitely get cheaper raw food by getting the ones that have, uh, you know, other stuff mixed in that's animal only. They put less effort into hygiene and stuff like that than they would for a human one. So it may be like half the price, maybe five pound a kilo, something like that. But I will just draw a point of comparison. A lot of people would say that's too expensive. If you buy a normal premium-ish brand of prepared like tinned or packaged cat food from a supermarket, 
it is the equivalent of about 10 pound a kilo and sometimes more like 20 pound a kilo depending yeah premium maybe 20 up to 20 normal not dirt cheap generic but you know what i guess a lot of people buy is about 10 pound a kilo and the absolute cheapest generic cat food is maybe five pound a kilo but here's the difference that cat food has a lot of other stuff in it which is not beneficial for a cat or anyone honestly anything other than i don't know bacteria maybe um that i wouldn't feed to anyone so it's about the same price but it doesn't have all the awful you know whatever chemicals cats do not need carbohydrates i know this channel we're a fan of saying you know maybe a keto diet long term is not beneficial that is not true for cats they are just fine on a ketogenic diet they're just well, that's fine what they're made for really isn't exactly it? <laughs> they're just fine on a carnivore diet uh, again they might like something with some carbohydrate and sometimes doesn't mean it's good for them so no grain no grains no root vegetables no vegetables none of this this is not no cat fruit. food no fruit now again look i remember one of our cats used to eat goji berries out of the jar you know like a handful or something i'm not saying that any of this stuff is the end of the world but i'm saying these are not staple foods the staple Correct. food for a cat is raw meat yes connective and muscle because there's different amino acids profile in both and both are important um and um and then some heart for the tory okay. that's and, um, all they need Going back to you finding your source for the minced beef and the minced chicken, what do you recommend when somebody's looking? Because I'm, I'm not sure if you want to share, you know, your supplier here or when you're looking for a company, because I know you do this for your, you know, for in all the things you do. How do you make sure that you, you're you getting this a good source, a good supplier? Well, obviously the ideal thing is it's somewhere within driving distance. You go, you talk to them, you go and meet the, the cows, the chickens, whatever. Um, I realized that for a lot of people is not feasible for various reasons. I have done that before, but that's not currently what we're doing. Uh, the second best bet is to buy directly from the farm. Uh, you know, on the website, they'll talk about how they look after the animal and that. Most websites don't. They just talk about like quality and safety and stuff like that. So you, you can straight away get, okay, they are not concerned about the health of the animal, probably, unless they just decided not to mention it. So you look for a website that's, you know, uh, either organic or 100% pasture raised in the case of ruminant animals, uh, you know, sorry, 100% grass fed in the case of ruminant animals, 100% pasture raised with the chickens. There's all this kind of stuff with chickens, right? Free range means they're probably still just in a barn, but there's one little hatch they can go out of and all this kind of stuff. So again, photos and stuff is ideal. And then I like to, you know, I communicate with the company as well and ask them questions and, if the answers are obviously coming from a customer service person who has no idea, then that's not ideal to me. If the answers are obviously coming from someone who actually owns the farm, the company, and understands my questions and you know gives sensible replies, which are satisfying to me. Obviously, you still have to take their word for it, but I'm saying you, you actually screen out the vast majority of people because the vast majority of people are not even pretending to care about the animal's welfare. The vast majority of people are not even pretending to care about the animal's health. And the vast majority of people are not even pretending to care about your health. So I realize that none of what I'm saying is a guarantee that you're going to end up with quality, but you are massively increasing the odds <laughs> by doing this due diligence. And it, this depends also what country you're in. So in the UK, there is this uh, organization called Pasture for Life. So I go, for, you know, you can start on the Pasture for Life website and they have a bunch of farms that they recommend that are pasture for life certified so they certify that uh the ruminants again cows uh lamb deer are 100 percent grass-fed and so when i go to those websites some of them also have chickens and so i figure if they are doing pasture for life with their ruminants they're probably also going to be treating their chickens better probably um, so that's another avenue to go down um, potentially as well. And depending on your country, you might have a different system, but that's in the UK. No, that's really good because it's very helpful. Sometimes you may not even know where to begin, especially if this is your first step in. So just even that little 
indication of Pasture for Life or whatever that equivalent is into the States, because we're here in the UK now, that is a beginning starting point, which can take a lot of the stress out potentially for, for our, our lovely listeners. So perfect. Thank you yes. for that addition. And, it, and, you know, to ask your question as well, one of the other things is cost, you know, like I am not one of those people who, you know, money is no object, certainly. And so a lot of the even what uh, websites on the pasture for life are fairly expensive and this is often due to supply and demand which is fair enough right if if at a certain price you keep selling out immediately then you raise your prices that's fine so often i would look for the maybe hmm, what's the ones how do i say it the ones with less marketing savvy um but who still produce perfectly decent meat and i would get from them um, i mean this keeps changing but one of the places i usually get pet Pet food farm is a farm in Yorkshire called Rosewood, um, who are Pasture for Life certified, and 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 then I it's not, I don't know if this is true for Rosewood, but you know if if money is a serious issue, then you can contact these people and say, look, I, I want meat, but it's for my animals. Is there some that maybe your you know, offcuts your thing something? Yeah. yeah, and again, I, you know, personally, I wouldn't do the uh, like liver and stuff because of my concerns about uh you know it's not just the vitamin a i mean the the liver tends to accumulate all kinds of toxins unfortunately so that wouldn't be my go-to thing but yeah in terms of just to say like connective tissue and stuff it's, it's less about the quality of the meat because anything you can pretty much put in minced beef or chicken it's more about like maybe there were some hygiene issues or maybe they left it out of the fridge for too long and all the rest and they're not allowed to sell it to humans but they could still sell it for, you know, animal use potentially. I don't know if that's legal, to be honest. I can't remember. But, uh, you know, you can reach out to them and maybe come to some kind of uh, understanding with them that it's – honestly, I mean, certainly in the case of ruminants, uh, beef and all the rest, it's perfectly safe for humans actually anyway. It's certainly safe for animals, you know, certainly safe for your dog, as we talked about, who has this incredible stomach with – very high stomach acid production as you said they can eat literal excrement they can eat literal rotting food they're going to be fine with like beef that was accidentally left out of the fridge for you know too many hours or whatever it's 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 not a problem so um yeah so those are ways i'd say that you can save money uh and do it and then other than that yeah as i said like preparation i mean <clears throat> i suppose the only thing that makes it a little bit more difficult is it's going to be kept in the fridge if you don't feed it all at once as that's but no, that's that's true for packet food as well, though, right? You've got to put it in the fridge if you don't feed it all. Yeah, just, just exactly. Bigger, just bigger packets, I guess. But, yeah, I mean, it's as easy as that. Um, with transitioning, they say if you go from 100% cooked food diet to a raw food diet, it does – there is a very different microbiome uh, profile for that. And so often it gives the animals diarrhea if you just go too quickly from 100% one to 100% the other. So the way they usually recommend to do it is, like, start off just adding a little bit of raw meat and just – you know, start off with 10% raw, 90% what they used to, and then just kind of up it gradually in increments until you end up being 100% raw. But, in, you know, if you're starting off, and, you know, and ditto if you get a new cat, kitten or puppy or whatever, give it the food it's used to, whatever they tell you, but, again, just kind of transition over. And, of course, if you are actually having animals being born with you, then, as far as I'm concerned, straight from, you know, mother's milk, to real, real food as it would be in nature, right? That's just completely normal. Perfect. Okay. Thank you for that deep dive in the nutrition, because I know uh, for me as well, if I was listening to this for the first time, I'd be like, okay, where do I start? What do I get? Who do I go to? Please tell me. I just want to press that button. <clears throat> and let me comment a bit on dogs, right? Because as I said, cats are pretty simple. They want meat. They are carnivores. That is simple. Um, with dogs, there's a bit more, you know, they are omnivores. There are other things they can eat. You don't want to give them super high fat meats, as we've talked about. So give them more leaner mince, for instance, um, rather than like a full fat mince, if you're giving them mince. Um, should they have any vegetable matter, I guess, is an issue of some contention. I, I don't know. Um, I know our dog really always only wants to eat animal food. Uh, our dog would be a carnivore if we let her. Uh, but occasionally they do want, you know, some vegetables. And, you know, cats too, right? They go and eat grass occasionally um, if uh, they want to detox because it, you know, it does stimulate more bar flow and it can make them vomit. Uh, although our cats don't really do that. Um, but I know that they can do that. And so in the case of dogs, 
Um, should they be having some plant foods? I would say, you know, yes. Obviously, you have to be aware of which ones are and aren't good for them. So if you are feeding them the way I'm saying, obviously, in the case of you buying packet food, it already has some food in. And if it's unhealthy, it's going to be, you know, wheat and corn and soy and all that crap. If it is healthy, maybe it has, you know, sweet potato and kale and stuff I've seen in dog food. Um like, don't assume that just because it's good for humans, it's good for dogs. That's the number one advice. So anything you're considering giving the dog, look it up, Google it or whatever, and see is this safe for dogs before you give it to them? Because they, you know, especially dogs are always, you know, eat whatever you'll give them if they're hungry and uh, it's very easy that they might eat something. So that would be my one piece of advice. My opinion on it is probably like root vegetables, uh, especially might be appropriate for... Uh, dogs so i'm okay with that um you know but some fruit but generally i don't know it's not usually their favorite right uh but if they want it like i'm, I'm okay with giving them fruits and vegetables basically because uh, i think they would have been adapted to that for a longer period in the case of grains again you know most diets including even human diets grains is a relatively recent addition so that's probably a little bit more problematic and so i would be a bit more careful with adding grains though again like maybe a rice or something would you know not be too bad as it's pretty hypoallergenic for for dogs too okay that great very good clarification there because yeah like we said or look at too with the um dogs there there versus the cats you know there is that little bit of difference there yep okay all right so beautiful on nutrition so number three we're looking at of the rejuvenate blueprint which is our excesses our our, our uh, toxicity so where would you or you know how would you look at that for these pets well with everything i've just said look at how much we've already reduced right because most of it is in <laughs> this artificial food so we've already dealt with a lot of it um other than that i mean you know keep medications and all that kind of stuff to a minimum but honestly if they need it they need it they should be perfectly capable of dealing with it as long as everything else is in place as long as they do have good nutrition as we've talked about um you know i i'm trying to think what people do you know like skincare products i would you know not use them on animals in in general i i have never used it i guess you wouldn't usually because they have fur uh, so that should be okay you know, clothing is not an issue uh, water i mean we do feed them our purified water but then you know our dog prefers to drink out of a muddy stream and <laughs> you know it's like i've just filtered all this water and you're going <laughs> and there's all this rubbish in that <laughs> right on the side of the road and you're just lapping it up okay great and, and then our cat <laughs> likes to drink out of the aquarium uh which annoys my wife so you know like yeah uh, I, you know, I don't think toxicity basically is uh, such an issue for them. I think allergies often is if the other stuff is not dialed in. Um, like it could be, you know, allergens in the air, but more likely like contact allergens, right? They could, they could like uh, skin issues can often occur because of the contact allergens. Yeah, this is one of the areas, and maybe we we'll save it for after, but like I see a lot, especially within dogs, um, like this yeast overgrowth where they have this, especially on the, you see it in the animals that are white, this, this uh, reddish orange brown around their mouth in between their paws, the constant licking, things like that. Um, would that be under this category of toxicities because it's fungal overgrowth or yeast or, you know? I mean, that's, like that. that's a chronic infection. Um, okay. So, yeah, we can get into that there. So, yeah, and I agree. I think chronic infections are more of an issue than toxicities. Uh, so I'm not worried about it as long as you feed them the good food. Um, All right. So toxicities really mostly could be or the potential for the animals is really coming from the foods that you're buying. So make sure it's the top quality. Basically. Okay. Okay. All right. So then within number four, then here we go with it. Yeah. The um, hormones, neurotransmitters, peptides, those signaling agents. Yeah. The cell signaling agents. So I don't have a lot of expertise with this. Um, there are endocrine disruptions with cats and dogs. They do exist. There are such a thing as cat and dog endocrinologists. Uh, they're considered to be relatively rare. Um, beyond my investigation with the thyroid, um, I am not like, I, I don't know, basically, if uh, if there are other... Uh, I think, you know, all right, well, let's go through them. So in terms of the sex hormones, um, 
there would be the same disruption from en- uh, from estrogen, for instance, xenoestrogen, phytoestrogens, and all the rest of it. So, but again, if you're giving them a good diet, I w- you know, it's probably unlikely to be an issue. Well, then- let me ask you this, because most pets are neutered. Like, how what effect is that having on, on them from a very young age with their hormones? Yeah, I mean, it's going to uh, <laughs> it's going to have a uh, an impact. I mean, it's going to reduce. From a longevity point of view, neutering is actually not really a bad thing, um, which is partly the justification for, um, you know, some of the chemical neutering that's being done to us. Uh, Like, for instance, a lot of the demonizing of DHT is based on the fact that um, the castratos, you know, men used to be castrated more regularly and they would never develop male pattern baldness and they would never develop a lot of other issues and they would be healthier. There's an argument to be made that the sex hormones, while they have benefits and all the rest of it, like like it's beneficial to have high testosterone in relation to estrogen, it's beneficial to have high progesterone in relation to estrogen, that kind of stuff. But if you just like remove them altogether, it's not necessarily actually bad for from a longevity point of view, honestly. Um, so yeah, that, I wouldn't feel bad about that from a longevity point of view. You could feel bad about it from a, from a different point of view, but not really from a health point of view. Um, so yeah, like, but, but, you know, having loads of estrogens in the food and maybe in the water, uh, would still potentially create an issue. Uh, a lot of animals have kind of diabetes these days, kind of symptoms, right? Uh, which is an endocrine thing again. That's the uh, pancreas and es- insulin. But again, that's you know, based on diet, just feeding them carbs when they shouldn't be having any in the case of cats or when they shouldn't be having as many in the case of dogs. So again, I would say that's easily avoidable with the correct diet. Adrenal and thyroid, I think, is more of a potential issue, as we talked about. Uh, both animals, but especially dogs, can be traumatized. They can go into a kind of chronic sympathetic state Cats can as well, but it's just dogs are more susceptible. And so when you're in a chronic sympathetic state, then, you know, it can happen eventually that the adrenals are um, either chronically overstimulated, like Cushing's, or become insufficient in the case of Addison's. Uh, I believe in my investigation that that does happen with pets, but it's, you know, I think that's genuinely very rare. I think what probably is more common, though, just like it is much more common in humans, is way before the adrenals start to fail to a medical degree, the thyroid usually fails way, you know, way first. And so I think hypothyroidism, at least in the case of dogs who are more prone to anxiety, because they're just more socialized, you know. Um, you know, I mean, cats are kind of psychopaths, right? They don't feel guilt, they don't feel shame. Um <laughs> They're really cute ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they are. But, you know, like dogs are actually capable of guilt and shame and, uh, you know, and greater empathy and stuff like that. And so because of that, they are also more prone to all the other problems that come with being, you know, civilized that humans also have related to stress and trauma and fire and all the rest of it. So that would be my suspicion, I you know, as to why dogs are the most common mammal to have thyroid disruptions other than humans is because they are the most socialized and civilized and you know they have their behavior controlled by you know more developed prefrontal cortex whereas you know cats don't have that you know most other animals don't have that uh i guess dolphins have the you know developed prefrontal cortex as well but um you know they're a different kettle of fish dolphins right and they're generally not um tamed so uh but actually when they are tamed, right, that they also do suffer with anxiety and stuff like that. So, yeah, so I'd say adrenals and thyroid is probably the main thing I would look at in the area of hormones for pets. Okay. And then we're going on to uh, step five, which is our lifestyle and environment. Yeah. So let's touch upon this. So I realize just like with nutrition, people just have to do their best, right? Again, like if you can't afford it, you know, and, and all you can afford is two pound a kilo stuff. Oh, we didn't even talk about dry food, by the way. So, Again, dry food, I would say, is okay as a treat, but it should not be a staple. This is not like natural food. Um, now, an exception to that, if it is literally like we have like de- uh, dehydrated uh, l- lamb lung, for instance, that we give the dog, like that's technically a dry food, but it is also just a, it's it's just a meat. It's, you know, it's an organ, but it's a relatively low toxin one. It's fine. 
So that's fine. But when I say dry food, I'm talking about more what almost everyone actually gives their pets as dry food, right? Which almost always there's a bunch of uh, grains in there or other things which are suboptimal. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't really see any value in giving any dry food to animals. So yeah, but sorry, go back to your question. Um, lifestyle stuff. So it's, it's similar stuff, but obviously different from humans. In the case of sleep... You know, cats need a lot of sleep, dogs need sleep, but generally a lack of sleep is not the issue unless perhaps you are exposing them to a lot of noise pollution and that's something that you should be aware of. Both no uh, dogs and cats have significantly more sensitive hearing than humans and so if, you, you, you know, if your dog is unwell and all the other obvious stuff has not been addressed, consider if maybe there's a noise pollution issue stopping them sleeping. Uh, but usually sleep is not an issue for pets, I believe, in my experience. And so... Uh, when it comes to lifestyle stuff, to me, the issue is really um, a lack of uh, outside time and a lack of movement. That's the key thing. And that's something, again, that they share in common with humans. <laughs> you know, we talked about it. Um, now, this varies a bit, obviously, with dog breeds, right? There are some famously that need to be actively exercised for many hours a day, uh, like a border collie or something like that. Uh, some of them are much more placid and you know, are happy with 30 minutes walk. Like they really, they are kind of bred to be more, um, what's the word? Yeah, yeah, placid, you know, not needing, not wanting to move. So that's fine. So obviously you can calibrate this advice to the breed that you're dealing with. But I mean, our breeds, you know, Cavachon, it says that they're fine, you know, not with that, that whatever, an hour or less walking a day. I can tell you our dog is a lot happier with two or three hours, you know, so... I think generally still the more the better, just like with humans, you know, even though there is some variation with breeds in the case of dogs, right? Walk them, uh, let them outside as much as possible. If you can't let them outside, if you don't have a garden or the garden is not safe for them, then definitely walk them probably double the amount that it says on all these pet guides for the breed if you really want them to be healthy. Um, and I know that's more work or whatever for you, but again, you should be walking double the amount that it says in the pet guides for you to be healthy. And yes, I mean, all right, maybe border collies are an exception to that. But like, I think, you know, four to six hours walking a day is probably what's optimal for humans. I realize that's not possible for most people with their job and whatnot. But um, certainly, you know, walking your dog two hours a day instead of one hour is not going to be bad for you. Uh, as long as you're capable of it, right? As long as you're not injured or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. they, yeah. They that's a really good point. What's right for them is also right for you. Because I mean, and I don't know where this would come in, whether it's now uh, with lifestyle step number five or seven is also like playtime. Because sometimes I get so busy during the day on the computer, all of this. Okay, I've walked them, I fed them. Now I've got to do that. Now I've got to go do all the house stuff. It's like, <sighs> I'm lacking in playtime with them, like that kind of socialization. So I didn't know where that would fall into yours as well. Yeah, I think it would fall in this. Um, remind me of that. I just want to finish on um, walking because, you know, I so there is a benefit in the movement, but you know, if let's say you have a treadmill, is it acceptable to walk the dog on a treadmill an hour or two a day rather than outside? Um, and I would say it is better than not doing it, but it is way less beneficial, right? So for a few different reasons, and I want to you know list them. First of all. Getting actual sunlight, very beneficial. And honestly, possibly even, although it's less well studied, moonlight and starlight. Often I walk a dog both during the day and at night, and I feel like both are beneficial. Um, so that's one. Getting actual fresh air is beneficial. It may possibly not be for you if you have an allergy or something like that, but it almost certainly is for the dog, right? So absolutely uh, uh, outside walking is beneficial for that point of view. Number three, grounding. Uh, when you go for a walk, you're probably wearing shoes, so you're not actually electrically grounding to the earth, but the dog is. And so uh, having them actually have that opportunity to ground to the earth, there's all kinds of research about how grounding reduces uh, inflammation, increases the flow of uh, free electrons through the body, all kinds of stuff. And so absolutely that's essential for dogs, not just humans. You could say more so, again, because they're not adapted to not have it for as long as we probably have been as humans. Um, and 
yeah, mm, yeah, fresh air. Yeah, I think those would be the main things that I would touch on for the for the walking. So your question, great point with the playing. I think it varies a little bit. Again, partly by breed, but also, uh, do they have any other animals around? And do um, do they have freedom to move around without you? Right, like so. Uh, I mean, it's fun to do with our dog, but the dog has the garden. She has loads of cats, most of whom are friendly with her, and some of who do play and chase around with her. And she's always like chasing something. There's a there's a mini deer that often comes to the edge of the garden and like antagonizes the dog, and then the dog enjoys <laughs> like barking at the deer and like <laughs> running back and forth and stuff like that. Um, the squirrels, like, so I feel like it's less important in that context to play with the dog because the dog is being mentally, oh, and that's the thing I, I missed it. You could tell I was trying to find. That's the other thing about walking outside that's beneficial other than the other four things I listed. It's the mental stimulation for the dog. It's the new sights and sounds, but especially for a dog, smells. <laughs> That's, yeah, you know. somebody said to me that uh, the dog sniffing outside and doing that walk and doing all the stops is like them reading the newspaper. There's all this information that they're gathering along the way. Yes, yeah. Uh, someone I uh, follow, I think they said uh, they see it as taking the dog out for a sniff rather than as a walk. That's the right way of looking at it. And then if you think, look at it that way, you're not so bothered if they keep stopping. It's like, oh, well, that's the point. You're letting them sniff. So, yeah, absolutely. That mental stimulation is the other benefit of taking them outside as opposed to on a treadmill. Uh, so, yeah, to go to, back to your point, look, I think playing is fantastic. I mean, obviously, it's bonding for you and the dog. It's also really good for you. Uh, but I, f I, I would say it's essential if you have them in an apartment all day where you only walk them, you know, occasionally, whereas it's more... Op ideal if they are if they have other animals to play with if they're able to freely run around outside if there's other animals for them to interact with outside i think in that case it's uh, not as crucial although still uh desirable in an ideal world you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins minerals phytonutrients and more from the foods you eat however unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. Those are some things you do... <sighs> You do forget, and I know we recently did that episode on light, and I, which that was also all the points that you were discovering, that that is a nutrient, and you're just like, wow, there is just so much more to getting outside, not only for us, but for them as well. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, and all the light stuff we talked about is absolutely true for them, the, you know, the need for red light and the way it sets the circadian clock and all of that kind of stuff, absolutely. Okay, so for cats... Um, Everything I just said, I think, is even more true, obviously, other than the walking stuff, but, like, that need to go outside. Um, it, you know, if you live in the 20th floor of uh, an apartment building with a cat, uh, look, if it's the situation you're in, it's the situation you're in, but um, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of this. I think with dogs it's better because, as you say, they are quite bonded to the human, so... You can walk with them regularly, you can play with them, and it can kind of make up for that lack of free movement outside. In the cat, in the case of a cat, I mean, some breeds, you know, a bit, but overall, like, I really feel that they need that free movement outside. And now it does depend on the breeds. As I say, I've got the two polar opposites in, in our house. We have the Sphinx, who literally, they have this mutation that means that they're hairless. So, and they are, like, very bonded to their human so, you know, that would be one of the best breeds to have if you do not have a garden for them to be outside in. But like a, 
Bengal, as I said, which is actually, I think it's either a quarter or an eighth leopard cat, like a wild cat. Like, I do think it is cruel to keep them inside all the time. I just don't think it is right. And if that's the situation you're in, because you didn't realize whatever, I'm not judging you, but, and you can just do your best, but it is really not ideal. Uh, they they absolutely need not only the stimulation, everything we're just talking about with dogs, they need freedom, right? That's one of the things that distinguishes a cat from a dog. Uh, a cat is happy when in, it's a pack animal, as almost all mammals are. Uh, so long as you are a good leader that is benevolent and that they look up to you and respect and all the rest of it, it's basically happy. Um, and all the other stuff we're talking about is, you know, a, a bonus and help, good for the health, but not essential. A cat is, uh, I believe it's the only independent mammal that's not a, uh, a group animal, although it can, you know, depending on the cat, sometimes they can, you know, roam around in packs like lions do, whatever, pride of lions. But uh, they're, they're basically perfectly capable of being independent and desire independence. And so uh, I feel strongly they should be allowed outside, um, even if you don't have a garden, honestly. Now, I know a lot of this is, goes against a lot of advice. Cause, oh, you know, what happens? Something happens to them. What if they get run over? What if they get stolen? Um, so, this is a bit of a philosophical question, right? It's like, what is that saying of, uh, I'd rather live a day as a lion than a year as a sheep or something like that? Like, it's the idea that freedom is so important that even if it reduces lifespan, uh, it's worth it because I'd rather have a shorter life as a as a free person than a longer life as a slave. Now, that is a philosophy that <laughs> makes more sense to some humans than others, and it's a philosophy that makes a lot more sense for cats than dogs, as I just said, right? That, that it's just in their nature. And again, it does vary a bit by breed, but um, cats really like it, you know their freedom and their independence. Now, like example, Siberian as well, like I said, we have a few of now. They are a bit more on the dog end of the spectrum, and, you know, we let them out during the day and, you know, in the evening they'll all come back again and like we call them and they will come running. They'll come running even when we just go outside during the day, like they're friendly animals, but they love to be outside. And you can see if they're not, they get, they get antsy, they get uh, frustrated. They're more likely to start fights. They're more likely to destroy stuff. And yeah, I think you know, they're more likely to become unhealthy. Um, for all the reasons we talked about the sunlight, the grounding, uh, the movement, etc. But also, but for I think an addition, excuse me, an additional factor, uh, which is the freedom, which is the uh, the wildness and the you know the hunting and all the rest of it. Again, some people get upset about that, and it's like if you don't like the idea of hunting, you really shouldn't have a cat. That is, <laughs> it's their instinct. It's totally their instinct. Yeah. Yeah, and like they case, you know, there's way more dead mice than birds, but you know they occasionally kill a bird, and that, you know my wife doesn't like it; she really likes the bird. I'm like the birds, and she feeds them and stuff. Although out of reach of the cats, don't worry, she's not responsible with it. But it's like, um, it, as I say, it's pretty rare. But it's like, yeah, it's their instinct. You can't be upset with them. You, as I said, you you have, and again, I love them, but you know, it is it's a predator. And it is kind of a psychopath by any human standard, although, of course, you can't apply a human standard because it's a cat, not a human. But, you know, like, uh, and I think um, it, it, to not allow them the opportunity for that. Now, again, generally, cats who are tamed and you feed them and all the rest, they're not very good hunters because they don't have to hunt to survive. So I wouldn't be too worried about them killing too many animals in most cases, although some of them do get good at it anyway. Uh, but yeah, giving them that opportunity to hunt and stalk their prey and watch them. And, you know, you probably have this as well. Like our cats love to just watch the birds, right? Oh like, God, yeah. It's out of reach, <laughs> but you know, like that's mental stimulation is for them. As much as for a dog, it's, you know, walking along and sniffing and sniffing and sniffing. For the cat, it is like watching the birds and, you know, watching these different prey animals move around. They absolutely love it. And I think to deprive them of that, no wonder they become unhealthy. You know, I think... Uh, and this is skipping ahead a little bit to number seven, but you know a lot of seven is emotional, you know, uh, repression, right? It's to do with repression, and so um, there is kind of voluntary repression, like you know, because a dog does feel guilt and shame and stuff, it kind of represses its own instinct, and that can create problems. But in the case of a cat, it's more involuntary 
uh, suppression or op oppression, really, you could call it. Like you're not letting them live out their instincts and it does take a toll on them over time. So in terms of the safety aspect to address that, you know, you asked me about that when you moved here, all our cats that we allow outside, we do put trackers on them. Um, while they are outside, we take them off when they come back in. Yes, I know it's letting off a little bit of EMF radi radiation, so it's not ideal, but it's a compromise. But it basically means uh, we know where they are at all times. If ever we want to find them, we can turn on the uh, the GPS and the Bluetooth functionality, and we can track them down. It's also fun. You can see what they've been up to, where they've been since, you know, within it's a specific time period. quite entertaining, actually. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and that's also for the peace of mind too, uh, because the last thing you also want as that owner is to have undue stress. Oh, are they okay? Things like that. So, you know, yeah, it's like you said, it's it's weighing it out. Yeah, you get a little bit of this, but over here you got a lot of that. And this is partly cultural, right? It's like with kids. Like when you and I were young, I would just disappear all day. My parents would have no idea where I was, right? I mean, I understand it's very different these days. And, you know, we've with pets as well, right? It used to be like, you had a, you know, I know my wife's family, the cats would always be outdoors. They wouldn't be allowed in the house. Uh, they would still feed them, but you know, like you wouldn't worry about where the cat was. If you didn't see it for a few days, you might, oh, oh where's, you know, Timmy or whatever. Like, but it was not a thing that you would worry about. But of course, everything's different these days. You know, our whole culture is much more, well, at least in, in the, the so-called developed countries, it's, Everything's very infantilized, right? And we infantilize our adults and we really infantilize our children and we infantilize our pets. And so I understand if you just act like a normal person with 40 years ago, you would now be considered to be an irresponsible <laughs> pet owner or a heartless pet owner or whatever. Uh, and I think there's some benefit in that. I mean, there's less animal cruelty now than there was back then. So that's good. You know, there's, there's some progress. But anyway, um, yeah, so that's the way to me to get around that, to let them have freedom but you can still monitor them and, you know, know where they are. Perfect. Okay, great. I know that was a little bit longer, but it's quite a more open, um, it's a more broader subject for our, our, our pets, that, that lifestyle and that environment. So, okay, lifestyle and environment complete. So now moving on to uh, number six, pathogens. So I know I briefly touched on that before with those, uh, the chronic um condition with the fungal overgrowth or things like that. So yeah, let talk to us about this. So honestly, other than, uh, as I said, adopting that animal that had all those infections that then spread them, uh, they had ringworm as well, which then, you know, can affect every other animal. And my wife had to, you know, like she was obsessive about cleaning everything every day and all the rest of it, like to stop it spreading and all the rest. It was, and it was necessary on her part, right? Otherwise you'd probably still have it. Um, that was a nightmare for her and she took care of it really well. Um, so, but I say that to say, other than that, we've never had an issue with infectious things. And I think it's because of the nutrition thing. And I don't mean to oversimplify. I know a lot of people do this in the human realm. If you just eat the right diet, everything will be fine. And it's not just the nutrition. It's also everything we just talked about. It's the sunlight. It's a lack of emotional repression. It's this, that, and the other. But... I think if you put everything else in place, but I think diet is the most important thing. I, I think that is the biggest thing that can undermine the health of uh, pets because a lot of like human things, although they apply to animals, they're lesser, like the toxicity and like the emotional repression and stuff like that um, and the hormonal imbalances. So I think for the pets, like the nutrition really is key. And so if you feed them real food, I would say that these problems are usually pretty few and far between. And um, if they do come up, then you have the choice of either going the main mainstream vet route or, see, I wouldn't just give, you know, whatever you would do for a human, oregano, oil, garlic, wormwood, etc., cetera, willy-nilly. Uh, I know, and I honestly, I wouldn't even trust it because there's like people on Amazon that are selling basically like the same formulas for humans as for pets. I don't think there's been enough study on that to see to, if that's actually a good idea, to see if that's actually safe. I would say either go the mainstream route or like work with a pet naturopath, like someone who actually knows which of those <laughs> herbs are okay and which aren't. Because just as an example, for instance, garlic, you know, very common antifungal, antibacterial, whatever, 
recommended by naturopaths and functional medicine and all those kind of people for humans, but actually really toxic for dogs. You know, there's a lot of things that are toxic for them. So um, I don't have that expertise as to which natural things are and are not okay, as I said, because I've never had to develop it. Um, and I would also not recommend that if people do have to, because they're rescuing an animal or whatever, uh, guess I would say it's better to uh, go, it's probably better to give what the vet's giving you, honestly, than just to guess and use some herbal formula that you've used on a human before in terms of risk profile. Um, and if you do want to go the natural route, then make sure you go with someone who actually understands it and not some even generic formula that's supposedly for pets, but maybe hasn't been really uh, properly researched. Yeah, I mean, so I had my, well, I'm still dealing with the issue with the uh, fungal overgrowth for both of the dogs, actually. It's quite interesting. So this is, anyway, long story short, could tell that there was something going on with the skin, da da da, went to the vet. They're like, oh, it's probably an allergy. You're going to just have to put them on an antihistamine for the rest of their life, essentially. And here's a shampoo. Like, okay, great. No, not what I'm really looking for. Um, and then there is a, where I used to live, a holistic, um, well, the holistic, I mean, I go, here we go, credentials or expertise or, you know, experience, um, a wonderful pet, fo pet food shop um, that they made their own fresh food, da, 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 and he would always give you advice. And then when I started seeing him, he was like, okay, we have to go into this food. Food was the biggest thing that was started to shift it. Yeah, he also recommended certain supplements for the pets to help with their, um, you know, with their intestine, with their immune support potentially, or also like the fungal thing. So like that, that was also included in there, but food and diet, absolutely main thing. Yeah. So, and that was the other thing too, we were doing so well, and this is, this is the crux, because as well, when you're trying to shift and do things, as you're trying to shift and maybe their body isn't quite ready for that change, it can take you almost all the way back to the beginning. So you have to start all over again, which can be very frustrating. But like, um, that was the other thing of, but the vet really didn't have answers for me except for, okay, this is just what your rest of your life is going to look like. <laughs> I had this other individual that was like, okay, here's what you can do to start making changes. And it's been a long road. It really has. Because the other thing he also um, let me know that I didn't quite understand was certain things like warming pills, vaccinations, things like that will inflame the condition. And again, set you back. So that was another thing that I didn't understand either until that point. So I'm like, ah, oh, okay, no wonder. It feels like they're getting worse. Da, 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 da. It's like, well, did they have anything? And also too, I don't know, doses, that's out of my league, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. But as we just had the experience and the example with you in the food about vitamin A and that intensity, the experience of what the vets and you know the dosing that they put out what he explained to me was that dose is so incredibly high that it will automatically shift them back to zero and for all your progress will go. So let's do it like this. Let's break it down a little bit, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. They're still going to get the same effect and it's not going to just detract the progress that they have made as much as if you just took that whole dose. You know, again, this is an advice, not working. I'm just explaining my own experience of certain things that I was able to do. So, you know, that was really, really insightful. Yeah, and I said that toxicity is not such a big deal, but of course, once they are already toxic and inflamed, as you're describing, then toxicity is a big deal, right? And as you say, every toxic insult, uh, including the ones you mentioned there, can absolutely be a big setback. Um, so yeah, but yeah, as you said, you know, in your case as well, right? Diet was really the key. Completely. And then again, you know, having the guidance there, that's what I was like for that nutrition. It's like, okay, where'd you go? What'd you do? How'd you do it? <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. So moving on to the final step, step seven, this wonderful little aspect for our beautiful, beautiful friends, emotions and mindset. <laughs> Yeah, I think we've really pretty much covered that. So, you know, with the lifestyle stuff, I think, as I said, in the case of a dog, you know, what's really making them happy is if they feel they're part of a pack, that they are valued and appreciated, but also that they, you know, respect the the owner as the as the boss. They are clear on what the owner wants. They're not confused. Um, then I think that helps them to feel relaxed and happy. 
And other than that, if, as I say, feeling useful, so this is going for a walk, you might think, oh, I'm doing it for the dog's benefit, but the dog kind of feels like, oh, I'm protecting this person, I'm helping them, you know, so like doing something with them that makes them feel like they are offering value to you, I think is really good. And, you know, try and remember that, um, you know, if they, if they make mistakes, you know, if you, if you scold them and, and, and punish them and all the rest of it, that the more you're doing that, yes, I understand, you may feel it's necessary to some degree, uh, you know, to correct bad behavior and stuff if they just destroyed something really expensive or whatever they've done. Um, but, you know, it can build up more and more of this tension and, and stress in their body. And so it is much better. And I think most of the people who teach dog behavior stuff will say this um, to only to to work by positive reinforcement rather than punishment, you know. So if you ask a dog to do something and it doesn't do it 10 times, you don't start shouting and all the rest, you just keep saying it. And then eventually if they happen to do it even by accident. You go, good dog, and you reward them. And then they're like, oh, right. And so like it's much better <laughs> if, you know, basically always do it with positive reinforcement. But it's not quite as simple as that. As I said, I think making sure that you have authority with your dog and that they respect you is super, super important. And I know it sounds a bit like whatever, authoritarian, but... Um, you may disagree of like humans being that way of each other. That's fine. You want everyone to be egalitarian and communal, but like dogs, if you treat them like, you know, I'm equal with you, they don't like it. It, it creates anxiety in them. They are pack animals. They expect someone to be the boss, someone to be the alpha. If it's not you, then they think it's them. And so this can be confusing for a dog. If one minute you're treating them like they're the boss, then they're like, oh, okay, fair enough, I'm the boss. But then they do something that you don't like and then that you punish them or you're unhappy with them. And they're like, oh, I thought I was the boss. Oh, you're the boss after all. Like, so they don't like that. So it's it's much better to just have a benevolent authoritative position with them in the case of dogs. In the case of cats, as I say, very different. Um, just treat them, <laughs> treat them. <laughs> You know, with love and Cats kindness and all the rest. But, <laughs> but and if they misbehave, to me, it's, um, you know, if they start breaking stuff or destroying stuff, whatever, to me, that is simply a sign of one thing and one thing only, and it is not enough time outdoors. Like, if they're scratching the furniture, if they're knocking stuff over, if they're attacking you, if, you know, whatever the undesirable behavior is, to me, that is 100% all rooted in not enough outdoor time. If they have enough outdoor time, and when they come in, they respect the environment, they are happy, they are relaxed, they are friendly, you know, in my experience, that's what it requires. It, the home should be a refuge for them, right? You know, if you think about outdoor cats, it's like, oh, I wish I could come in where it's all nice and warm, you know? So it's like, and then, but if they're indoor cats, like, oh, I'm trapped in here, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a restrictive prison, I'm not allowed to do anything fun, right? So you wanna give them enough outdoor time that they appreciate being indoors, and they are happy to behave when they're indoors because there's no way you're going to train them to behave the way you want indoors. For me, the only key is that they have enough time outdoors that when they're indoors, they are happy to be there. What a list. What a list. Oh, when, you, um, when we were discussing doing this episode, I was like, oh, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> so no, this has been very insightful. Um, this, because as well, I know... Not only for, for me when I've got friends, family, or anything like that, and they're suffering with certain issues, it's difficult enough being able to speak to them, talk to them, and, and help them figure it out. But with our pets, like there is no ability to have that communication. Like you said, with um, you, you know the first with with a second example with Elon, like or no wait was it it was the first one with. Um, uh, with, yeah, with Shanti, with the with the pain, like they don't ha really have that ability to communicate in that verbal way, certain things. So, so yeah, so being able to watch for these signs, and then also being able to have a plan of action like this to support them in a great way without it always just being okay this is the vet path this is that because as we've identified not only for us in our life but as some of the um, examples that we shared here, sometimes they don't have the answer either. Yeah. yeah, and they're just you know treating symptoms, not root causes, right? Exactly, exactly. So this has been really fun for me. Um, before we close, because I'm pretty sure we're at time, and and is there are there any any final thoughts that you have for all of those that have uh, come to the end of this with us today? 
Uh, yeah, I don't claim to be the world's authority on pets, and so I'm happy to, very happy to hear what you have to think, right? Uh, what you have to say, what you think. Tell us in the comment section uh, on YouTube or Rumble, and uh, yeah, tell us what we're missing, tell us what you think we got wrong, tell us what you agreed with, tell us your own experiences. Uh, let's crowdsource together, because this is a great audience that we have. You know, I'm, I'm often impressed by the insightfulness and you know, caring and stuff in the comments that we get. We have a you know great group of people watching. So let's help each other. Let's um, put so, you know any insights that we have, let's share them with the group. And together, uh, we'll get uh, better and better at all this stuff, including uh, helping our pets. Fantastic. And again, everyone, thank you so much. We love spending time with you. Remember to please, you know, again, if you've got questions, let us know. Because as we always do, as Elwin rightly does, you know, he gets to as many and all of them as he possibly can. So until next time, please remember to hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And we'll see you then. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.